Hey everybody, it's Gil here with the Sailing Vessel Dream Chaser. And last week I took you along with me while I took my dad to a play of Hello Dolly. It was actually a ton of fun. Way more fun than I thought I was going to have at it. And frankly, it was my idea, but I, I love this. It was really a good time. We also showed you a house that we found in Florida that we really liked. We went ahead and put an offer in on it. We did a little um, negotiation. We came to an agreement on price pending an inspection. And in this week's episode, we'll take you along on that inspection and show you what the outcome was of that particular deal. For those of you who have been viewers for a while, you know my wife and I typically do videos about our lifestyle living aboard our um, classic sailboat. We do that with our two grandchildren, 13 and 5 at this point. Um, it's been a very interesting couple of years. When our grandchildren moved in with us and, and we took, uh, we started taking care of them, we tried to stay in one place for a longer period of time, just give them some additional stability, get used to it, etc. But it, it's sort of time to start going along with that modified cruising lifestyle that Deb and I have wanted to do now for years and years, where we are not really retired, we're not um, you know, independently wealthy, that we're out um, just sailing around. I still work and my job is tremendously flexible, but it lets me live on the boat and you know, we can be kind of wherever we want to be as long as I can get to uh, you know, internet and access to work and, and frankly get to an airport when I need to travel. So it's been tremendous doing that. These last couple months have been crazy and hectic with me being in New Jersey. Deb stayed on the boat for a little bit of time, almost a month or so. Um, our plan was to move to Florida at some point anyway with the boat. So while I was in New Jersey, I ended up uh, taking a couple of days. I flew home. We loaded up the camper. We packed and prepared the boat to be by itself for a while with my daughter staying down on board. Uh, my daughter's 30 years old. Um, you, you've probably seen her in some of the videos acting all crazy. That's what I love about her. But you've seen her on the boat and she's going to be staying on Dream Chaser while we um, loaded up the camper, went to Florida and began a search for where we ultimately wanted to station the boat. And also we started considering home, buying a waterfront home where we can keep the boat at the home. Uh, that's what drove all of this sort of uniqueness. But I'll tell you, shopping for a house when you're sort of separate areas like this has been um, pretty challenging. I mean, think about how hard it would have been to do this years ago. Now, what happens is Deb and I each go on, you know, realtor.com. We find places that we like. We know what we're looking for, right? So we sort of have um, similar uh, approaches in the ones that'll work. We have our taste differences a little bit, but we send each other, um, you know, links or, or uh, yeah, links to the listings. Then we each go look at them. We read all the details uh, on the realtor website about the house itself, its construction, the year it was built, the tax history, how long it's been resold, right? Like there's a ton of information that you can get about properties. And most of these have quite a few pictures in them. Once we find one, we think, yep, that kind of looks like it would work for us. We'd like to see it. Deb reaches out to our realtor. Our realtor has been phenomenal. Um, you know, what we're looking for is a bit of a needle in a haystack. We need six feet of depth. We need over 70 feet of height between bridges and power lines. Um, we want a deep water canal and, you know, we're not spending a million bucks, which by the way, there's a lot of these houses that are out there if you got millions to spend, which we don't. So, um, so he's been tremendous helping us. So when we find one we like, Deb reaches out to our realtor. They go to the house and they look at it. And the first thing Deb does is she uh, she checks the depth of the water at the property. Um, we have this sort of uh, testing stick. It's five, uh, five foot sections of PVC that snap together and they're painted and marked at one foot increments. So she can just go to the water line uh, at the edge of the dock or the uh, or the boat lift or whatever it happens to be and and check the depth there. She notes the time. We check the tide charts to know if it's high or low tide in that particular area, and we get an idea of the depth. If the depth looks like it's going to be okay, then she goes into the house and she brings the GoPro and actually does a complete walkthrough, saying, you know, I'm going from the front door, I'm turning left to this, right? And so a complete um, sort of narrated walkthrough. She uploads those to a Google Drive for me, sends me a link telling me it's there. I look through that. We probably spend 30 minutes on the phone talking about the property. And if it's one we think we'd literally like, then we uh, then we you know talk about making an offer. And that's exactly what we did with the property you saw last week. So one of the really cool things we can do because we're looking at these houses remotely, if you've never done this, um, Google Earth is an application. You can run it on a Mac or, or, um, or Windows machine. If you run a Chrome, plug, a Chrome browser, you can also put a plug in and just do it right from the web. Uh, I'll show you this in a few minutes, but it's really cool. There's a tool in Google Earth that lets you um, measure distances from satellite images. So you can measure the linear feet of seawall, for example, along the property line. I can measure across the canal and see how wide it is. Just truly amazing tools. So what you do is you just go into Google Earth. Uh, you can either download the app or if you do it through Chrome, you can uh, actually just do it right in a web browser. 
So I'm going to go ahead and search for the area I'm looking for here, and I'll just go into Cape Coral. Um, because I'm not looking at anything specific, I will just essentially pull up any sort of canal lot, if you will, in some of the areas where we've been looking. So let's just go ahead and choose a canal, you know, right in, in here, let's say. And we'll do right on this corner area just because I think it'll be an interesting way to see the difference in these. I'm going to really zoom in quite a bit here and I want to do this at almost a home level so we can kind of show you what it would look like if you were really exploring one of the homes. By the way, Google is truly amazing. Uh, these have an option for either doing three-dimensional views or two-dimensional and when you're doing measurements it's probably best to do two-dimensional. So that's what I'm going to continue to do. Let me just rotate this around. Uh, I'm going to go back to 2D and I'm going to zoom in a little further. Now here's what's interesting. If I were interested in this house, let's say, and I wanted to know what my distance was across this canal, there's a little measurement tool. Come over here and choose your, um, you know, the value you want to use instead of meters, I'm going to use feet. And essentially I'm going to measure from, um, you know, the edge of this boathouse to, let's just say, the edge of this dock. And you can see it's about 48 feet. So that would be a pretty good piece of information to know if you were wanting to take a look at this particular property. So I'm gonna move up here in a, in a different area just to kind of show something that's a bit interesting. Let's just say you were looking at this property and you wanted to know what your turnaround capability would be here. Again, you can click right on the edge of this particular dock and right against that particular seawall and I can see it's 73 feet right there. Um, what's interesting is when I do that, I also can take a look if I needed to know how much room would I have between these two to fit my boat. Well, I have about 47 feet. Uh, and you know that would be a pretty tough way to turn in there with the size of our boat. Um, if I wanted to know the property width on this, the linear feet, for example, I could just sort of click on here, and you could sort of eyeball about where the middle of that property is, and you know it's 81 feet um, across that that you know linear feet along the waterfront. So it's really a cool way to take a look at this, and then. Just to make sure I was measuring this correctly, I also went into the Google image of where our boat's stored, and this isn't it obviously, but I did a quick measurement. So, okay, my boat measures, uh, you know, this one this example was 20 feet. Mine actually showed 54 feet, um, I think about 56 with the bowsprit. But what it lets me know is that um, relative, if I, let's just say this whole measuring system was off by 10%, well, it would be off on my boat as well. Um, What's really cool about this is you can now take these images and you can start to play around. If I had my boat here and I needed 56 feet and I would need to rotate around, for example, let's just come out here and do 56 feet. You can quickly see if I were to, if I were to tide right here, I would have a tough time rotating around this particular spot and getting out. It would just look at how tight that would be if I were trying to rotate around it. I mean, in my case, my bowsprit would probably be going over the edge of that dock uh, if I were to try to do it at that particular place. So you start to, sort of see what your options look like. I, I'm just blown away by the, the Google Earth components. And what's really neat, I just, I'll just do this because I think it's amazing um, sort of technology, if you will. The fact that the 3D images are pretty good. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, it's not an actual photograph here of, um, of all this detail. And when you look at things like Actually, this is pretty cool even. So how, how it sort of knows this, um, watch, I'm gonna go 2D for a second. When I go 2D, right, you guys are all boaters typically, you see here's a power boat, here's a sailboat, and these boats are not sitting in their, uh, in their docks with the sails up, but Google decides that if it's a sailboat, they're gonna put a sort of pseudo sail on those particular uh, boats. I just think that is the coolest thing that they sort of do that from a three-dimensional perspective. Look, so you see power boat with a bimini, sailboat, and they sort of it sort of added a little bit of a sail to it. That's just just amazing. But even uh, even the trees, like I just seriously looking at the level of detail here is just amazing to me. The fact that you can, you know, if you want to know what it would be like to go down this canal, no problem. You can uh, you can rotate yourself all the way around. So there's a nice house, huh? Uh, I can rotate myself all the way around, and if I were to want to go out to main water here, I can just very quickly and easily rotate myself around. I know the way, the way I get out of here, because Devin and I have sounded this out. No problem. Just going to go right down this waterway, come right up here with the curve to the right. And I think about 
what this was like when Deb and I were buying our first house, you know, 25, 30 years ago, whatever it was, um, and how challenging these types of things would have been. You would have had to travel there with a list of things you told the realtor and trust the realtor lined up the right ones for you, and that's how you'd go about it. Um, perfectly candid, we probably bring more things to our realtor that we are interested in than he brings to us. He's great, and he brings them to us as well, but the tools available to a consumer are just amazing. Uh, it's, it's wonderful, and I think we are in a culture these days where we want to self-serve, right? We want to be able to look up our own information, do our own research, etc. So it's uh, it's a great set of tools out there. And so let's get back to this house in Cape Coral that Deb and I came to an agreement on. In last week's video, we showed you the whole walkthrough. And, um, and interestingly enough, when we made the offer, I still hadn't seen this house yet. I've seen the pictures of it. Um, I've looked at it for a long time. Deb and I were both really interested in this house. I think I mentioned in last week's video, it was one of the first ones we saw before we even got to Florida. It was on the market. And we have some friends in the area that had sailed down that way. And we said, hey, if you guys have an afternoon free, would you mind? There's an open house this day. I'd love for you to just take a look. Like, I'm curious what it looks like. You know, what do you what you think? Um, just to get a live sort of perception about it. And they did and, you know, gave us their feedback. Um, so Deb and I have liked this house for a long time. It was priced a little higher than what we thought it would be worth, given its location and some of the attributes of it. Um, but when the price started coming down, there were a few compromises. We thought that this would be a really good house in this particular area, um, and especially at the price it was at and where we, we sort of negotiated. Um, of course, all those offers are contingent upon a home inspection. So here we have the house from the front. We uh, had an appointment at about 12.30 with the home inspector. We got there about um, quarter to 12. He was already there. It was great. And while he was doing the inspection, um, it started to rain, which in the end turned out to be a really good thing. Um, you know, you can see we took the picture from the road out front, the little video, and then in this little outdoor, what they call Florida room, screened in, closed in room, um, you know, you could, you could hear the wind blow in as the rain went and a nice breeze going through, but it was really kind of cool um, to be able to sit out there and do that. In the attic, it was interesting. I was shocked to see that the the decking actually was not plywood. It was hardwood boards um, put together. And what you're seeing here is, you know, I was trying to just take a look at how the actual rafters are attached to the concrete block. The homes in Florida, most are concrete block homes. Um, and I'm really curious, if anybody watching this has any idea what this type of marking might be, I'd be really interested to know. So let's talk a little bit more about this house. We actually had an appointment at 12.30 with the home inspector. Deb and I tried to get there a little early. We wanted to walk, walk along the seawall and stuff, and I just wanted to walk the property since I haven't actually been there before. We probably got there about 11.45, and to our surprise, the inspector was already there. It was kind of neat. It was two guys, and they had already um, put their ladder up uh, and had walked the roof. Um, when I got there, they said, yeah, you know, we just kind of looked at some of the outside while we wait for the realtor to get here. And we did see a couple of little small things with shingles, right? But, you know, more as we get into the inspection. After the inspectors were there for maybe an hour, an hour and a half, it started to rain. It started to rain pretty hard. You actually saw some of that in the footage a couple of minutes ago from the Florida room where the wind was blowing and you could hear the wind blowing through that, at, at that exterior room, but it still stayed pretty dry. Um, but I think it turned out to be really good that the, uh, the rain started while the inspectors were there. In Florida, there's a couple of additional components that are part of a home inspection that aren't in other parts of the country. Uh, I won't get the names exactly right, but there's essentially an inspection about the way the, the method by which the roof is attached to the concrete block homes, uh, and the other one has to do with some kind of a wind survey. It has to do with the angle of roof, attachment, all these things. And they do that because the area is susceptible to hurricanes. All of those items are over and above prices for your home inspection, right? So you pay your home inspection and then, you know, the wind surveys and other X dollars and, and Y dollars, whatever. Um, so after three or three and a half hours, the inspector came up to us and said, listen, I, I want to, before I start doing those other components, I wanted to share with you what I found. Uh, and I appreciated that, right? If you think about what he was doing, he's potentially going to make himself less money if we were going to pass on the house. But I think it's a good customer service related item, right? He said, let me show you what I found. And if you're not going to move forward with this, I won't bother doing these other pieces. I thought that was a, uh, it was a pretty cool thing for them to do as a company, I guess, if you will. Just, you know, I'm in this customer, customer success sort of thing where I think about customers' outcomes all the time. And, and I think that was a cool thing that they did. So anytime you do a home inspection, you sort of expect that you're going to find some issues here and there, right? It's not uncommon that you're going to run into wear and tear items and maintenance items. And this was a 40 plus year old home, so I certainly didn't expect brand new construction. 
But there were a few things that the inspector found that I thought were pretty important, uh, and they were bigger than just your average maintenance item. So a couple of those items to note is um, there was a leak in the roof. Uh, we actually saw it on the outside of the soffit, right outside of the Florida room. Um, there was water dripping out of the soffits, and if you reached up and just touched it, you could just stick your finger right through the wood. I mean, it was that rotted. It wasn't a really large section, maybe three, three and a half feet in diameter on that kind of edge of the house. Likely a cause of just like a clogged up gutter for years with bad flashing or something like that. But it was certainly something that was going to have to be repaired. Um, and the question is, if you found it in that one spot, where else was it? There were also a few leaks around gutters and around flashing in the lanai. Um, and those were things that we would, you know, obviously need to look at or at least address. And it was something good, good to know going into it. The other thing that the inspector shared with us is the age of the air conditioned units. Most of the homes in Florida have had additions to them. A lot of these in Cape Coral, for example, were old two bedroom, two bath, like vacation homes. Um, so over the years, people have enclosed them, built onto them, added Florida rooms, which is a sort of like a um, like an enclosed area, maybe without air conditioning and heat, that is then connected to an exterior living area, which is then connected to a screened lanai, typically over a pool or patio area. But he did share with us that the two air conditioning units were both probably at near the end of their serviceable life. Um, one was likely installed when the addition was put on. The other one looked like it was still the original at 40 years old. Um, so they definitely were, were something that we'd have to consider um, and, and likely have to replace. The other thing, and this was one of the ones that I think was a bit more major for us, one of the other things that they found was some really oddball things in the wiring. Um, so for example, I mentioned that this home had had additions put onto it, or an, at least an addition. Um, we saw things in the attic where, for example, there was wire that was run down a wall, or, or, you know, probably to power outlets or, or lamps or something like that. And, um, and they were not actually connected in a junction box. So if you think about it, there'd be raw wire coming up out of the wall into the attic, maybe stapled or tie wrapped to a rafter, and another wire coming over, and they were twist tied together with just a, you know, a wire nut. Um, not terrible, but, but definitely not to, to sort of code, and, and it makes you wonder what else is odd out there. The ones that really had me a little bit more worried from an electrical perspective, um, I noticed one of these in like the, the living area, dining area, there was a, a plug on the wall, like a regular outlet, and in it was a, an extension cord. And the extension cord, um, you know, just kind of ran down along the baseboard, around the room, and then there was a hole drilled into the wall, and it went into the wall. Um, and there was an outlet on the other inside the other room right on that wall. So I think somebody actually installed an outlet and rather than wire it into the house, they essentially just ran it like permanently tied it into an extension cord that they would plug in another room. Um, I tested it and when I unplugged that extension cord, sure enough, the outlets in the other room went out. So you know you start to wonder, is this thing really planned from an electrical perspective? Um, that was one we also saw in the attic where something very similar would be wires coming up through like the sill plates on the top of the walls and the wires would go up to um you know up to connect to another extension cord like with wire nuts and then the other end of that extension cord would be plugged in an outlet in the attic and you know those kinds of things just had me nervous we saw those couple which ones didn't we see and what kind of mayhem might be in the walls we were a little bit worried about it it was something that really raised a pretty serious red flag air conditioners I get a roof repair sure we can look at that weird electrical wiring that starts to become a bit of a safety issue had me concerned and then there were two more items that um, that caused us a bit of pause in the garage we found evidence of potentially a flooding right water intrusion um, about the bottom three to five inches of the drywall it looked like it had been replaced um, not necessarily a terrible thing if the job was done right but in this case it was literally three to five inches cut across horizontally nailed on never finished never you know uh, spackled or painted or taped in bed or anything like that and it makes you wonder is that is that problem pervasive in the house and how is it covered so much of the house had wallpaper and even places where the wallpaper was sort of patched it makes you wonder was it done right was it not and it's an unknown it could have been perfect and it could have been bad and we just didn't know but the evidence of previous um, flooding of some extent and this could have been a water heater break or it could have literally been flooding flash flooding in the street who knows that went into the house but it raised pause for us and then the last thing, and this one was the one that was pretty major and in the end helped us make a decision. There's a decorative wall that goes around this whole property. If you noticed, it's very much a southwestern Spanish sort of or Mexican casa looking place, you know, concrete walls with archways uh, in it to view out. Very, very um, nice looking. But 
Along the waterway, the decorative wall is about three feet tall, and it actually sits right on the footing of the seawall. And unfortunately, the decorative wall is starting to lean inward, not out over the water, but inward. Um, typically, what causes something like that is if, we, if that decorative wall wasn't there, one of the things you look for in a seawall is to see if you have erosion, if the ground behind the seawall is starting to settle or go away. If it is, that's usually caused by, um, you know, over the years, waves and water and tide push up against that seawall. And there's seams in the seawall. Water does get behind the seawall. Water gets through the cracks of it. It goes underneath it at times. But if it continues to do that and it pulls that dirt out as the water laps up against it, then the ground settles behind it. Unfortunately, when there's a high tide or a storm, you need to make sure that the pressure exerted by the water against the seawall is equally um, responsive on the back end from the ground that ultimately supports it. So as that begins to wash out, it causes a weakness issue there. The bigger problem for us is in order to fix that, because it is repairable, we would have had to remove the decorative seawall completely and then do the repairs. And if you pulled this thing out since it was actually attached to the footing, what would have happened? Would it have damaged the seawall, etc.? So in the end, we ended up passing on this house. It was disappointing, but I think it was the right decision for sure. After a good night's sleep, I got on an early morning flight. It departed about 4.45 out of Fort Myers. I'm on my way back to New Jersey, but I had this lovely, lovely sunrise I got to see from the plane. I just could not get over how gorgeous this was to see the sun rising from just above the clouds, and hopefully you'll enjoy it as well. Sometimes Mother Nature's beauty is just amazing, and we often take it for granted. So this was a nice thing to see this morning, especially after a little bit of the disappointment of um, having to pass on the house that Deb and I were both excited about. Uh, it's one of those things where you just sort of realize there's a lot to be grateful that for there. I hope you enjoyed coming along for the home inspection and understand what we ended up deciding on that house. I think we'll end the video right here and we'll see you guys next week as I finish my flight back to New Jersey. We go to a little oval dirt track racing and we have a good old time up north. See y'all. Safe sailing, everybody.